Hello and welcome to another must add uh, live video. Um, my name is Paul Robinson, and this week doing something a little bit different. Um, not in the forge making shoes or out shoeing horses. I'm doing a a presentation, a presentation that I've give plenty of other places all over the world. Um, but it's just um, three case studies or. Uh, three different horses that I have showed in the past um, using bar shoes. Either it'd be machine made bar shoes straight out of a box or fabricated bar shoe or uh, handmade bar shoes. Um, just to try and uh, achieve the goal, you, you don't have to take a shoe straight out of the box. You have to have that ability to adapt and 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 shoe the foot 100% for what it wants every single time so I think some some of the, the shoes straight out the box just don't work so that's why this is why I'm doing this little presentation Um, it's not going to be too long uh, probably somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes so it's not going to take a lot of time out of your life so I hope you've got yourself a, a beer a cup of tea or whatever and you're sitting down and you're comfortable um, and hope you enjoy this I'm still getting the grips with doing this um, this presentation in the, in this way. So if it looks as if I'm studying the screen too much, it's just because I'm trying to figure out what to do. So anyway, this first horse is a big grey horse, obviously. And, you know, as a farrier, you're watching the horse walking towards you. You know, just SS balance and stuff like that. So the first noticeable thing is that its feet are pretty long, aren't they? and asked the customer um, when it was last shot. She wasn't too sure how long it had been shot, but had been told by the last farrier that it goes much better on a long shoeing cycle. So evidently it's not doing that great on its long shoeing cycle. Its heels are quite flat and run forward because it's got quite upright feet anyway. It's got upright pasterns and flat feet, so it's Heels are shot forward, its toes are long. <clears throat> Just generally a bit of a mess, aren't they? Um, I think probably if it had been shod, you know, every six weeks, five or six weeks like we do our horses, then everything would move back into position a little bit better. But the last farrier has, you know, he's, he's trying to shorten his toes up. Um, you can see he's got equilibrium shoes on as well too to bring that break over back um, and a little bit of separation at the toe so he is short, trying to shorten his feet up it's just the shoe and cycle is just way too long so having a wee look at it it's balance from the lateral view I have two blue dots on here and here now those are you can just see those if you look at your horses. Those are the dorsal and palmar borders of um, the second phalanx at the proximal end where it meets uh, P1. So the proximal interphalangeal joint. You can just see them underneath the skin. But if we take a line and bisect it evenly between those two dots, but take it from the center of the fetlock down through P1, P2, and with that line comes off the hair and hits the coronary band. If you drop that perpendicular line down onto the ground, it gives you a kind of a rough guide of where the center of rotation is, just looking at it from a lateral view. Now, we're going to see its toes are long anyway, and this is just a guide, but you can see how much shoe and toe is in front of that center of rotation in comparison to the amount of support and shoe and heel length that is to the rear of that center of rotation it's it's pretty well mismatched um, the dorsal wall you can see it's been rounded down and it's it's shortened up so when I mean, he's tried to shorten his toes it's just the shoe and cycle is just far too long <clears throat> so we all know about how to locate the center of rotation but i'll just put this slide in for for those people in maybe other countries that haven't haven't seen it or don't understand it. 
So in the trimmed hoof capsule, you're trying to trim your heels down to the widest part of the frog. We take our line from each of the heels up to the white line at the toe. And this creates this box that we have. Then we take our red lines in a diagonal from either side down to the corners. And where it crosses in the center, that's roughly where the, the center of rotation is. And that that point actually generally um, corresponds to the widest part of the hoof capsule as well too. So you can see by that that diagram there that there's about 60% of the, the horse's hoof is in front of that center of rotation. So from here to here in comparison to about 40% from there to there. And then that's where our shoeing comes in. You know, where we want our horses to last for our six weeks shoeing cycle. So that's with the application of our shoe and that little bit of extended length back here. We've got 50% from the toe to center of rotation and 50% from the center of rotation back to the heel. So that's what we perceive as, as the ideal. And that's what we try and strive to achieve every single day whenever we're shoeing horses. So going back to the case study again, um, the blue line, oh, I know that the, the hoof capsule's not trimmed here, um, but you know it, it's all part of you know, evaluating the hoof cap the hoof before we start shooting it. We can see that's pretty much where the, the blue line was on our lateral view. Um, it's near enough in the right place on the sole side of it as well too, to that center rotation, maybe it's just a little bit further back. Um, but you can see, still how much shoe and material there is to the front of that center of rotation in comparison to the length given to the, the back half of that hoof capsule. Um, I think as well also that horse had a uh, thrush and you can't see it there because the, I haven't got it cleaned up in this picture. Um, on the right hand side again we can see that the guy's tried to, to shorten its toes up. He's got his equilibrium shoes on, so he's bringing that break over back as far as he can. And he's trying to shorten his toes up. And this is what this um, area is here, where he's taken the hoof wall back and he's made it weak. And it's got muck and the white line's probably been exposed. And he's got muck up that white line. And it's just turned into a little bit of a mess. You can see in the other picture, just where it's all rounded down. That, you know, rounding the, the hoof capsule down itself rather than taking from a straight line from top to bottom is, is a real good idea. But how the hoof capsule moves under load, you know, I like to keep the hoof capsule wall as strong as possible so I can at the toe. And um, because we all know how the hoof capsule moves under load, the heel to open up and expand, the hoof capsule coronary band actually uh, moves back and compresses the dorsal wall at the toe as the heels open up they compress that way and also that way there and um, so the toe's got to be a, an awful strong part of the hoof capsule so i think if we if we over shorten that toe then we get more movement in the heels um, and then we all see it in our other shoes you get this excessive amount of, of heel wear in around about the heels anyway as the heels move but if you shorten that toe up more and um, that's what you're going to get you just get a weaker structure the hoof capsule itself is is really just a, a big hinge isn't it you know it's opened at the heels so if you're to take all that wall off at the toe you make it a pretty weak a pretty weak um, structure um so he opted for bar shoes just so I could give it the length that I wanted. I didn't want to put an open heel shoe on it um, just for that sheer effect in at the heels because it had a little bit of thrush. Um, plus I wanted to give it as much length and support as I possibly could. So I opted for a bar shoe and it's just a, a Jim Blurton bar shoe straight out the box. But you can see from the center of rotation um, that we located earlier on or roughly where the center of rotation is where we located it earlier on to the end of the shoe, which is the yellow line. Um, it's a little bit more than a 50% that we want. That's because I've tried to keep that, that hoof wall strong. But with the 
um, use of some forging in the correct place around the toe. It's actually forged all the way right around there to aid in breakover. That lever arm is reduced, so it is. You've brought that point of breakover back. <clears throat> so from that red line to the center of rotation should be equidistant to that red line to the center of rotation. And that's what we've tried to achieve. And that's what we did achieve. From the lateral view, again, taking those two dorsal and palmar borders and that line back through the P1 and P2 again, down to where the line hits the coronary band and perpendicular again. You can see now, after the horse has been shot, how much support that we've given it back here. So we've got our 50% to the blue line and again, 50% forward of the center of rotation to the red line at the toe. But still, the yellow line is the actual end of its foot, but this is all, remember, we've just beveled all of this off here. So we've kept that foot nice and strong. We've got a nice strong line down there, and it's kind of beveled back at the toe as well too, the same way as you would do on a back foot. So we've kept that hoof capsule as strong as we possibly can to um, make sure that we don't create a weakening in the hoof capsule those heels will never survive you know once you make that those that that toe strong on this that hoof capsule is moving more it's wearing away if you can if your heels are are making that amount of wear in a shoe what's the shoe doing to its heels as well too so a great improvement from the original picture um and that horse as well too she was away with that horse with the instruction of getting it shot every five or six weeks but i never actually seen it again so i had no follow-up pictures but i'm 100 percent certain that um the next shoeing cycle everything would have moved back a little piece of those heels would have come a little bit more upright and you'd be able to take them down a little bit more get them strong and move them back into position a little bit further back to where we really want them um, and how the horse shot up in the end up <coughs> you can see in that picture you know that that bevel line that we talked about, just the same as we do with our back foot. Kept it nice and strong. Nicely nailed on. Um, and you can just see the break over in there. So yeah, that was gonna be that was gonna be nice in the next shoe at the end of the next six weeks cycle, but as I say, we never got to see it, which was a shame. The next horse on the exact same yard, this is this is one of his top show jumpers, this horse. But um, I'll just take a wee step forward. You know, our confirmation. We all know what the ideal confirmation is. It says first horse, we take a perpendicular line from the point of the shoulder down to the bones, down to the knee, metacarpal, fetlock, pastern, hoof capsules. That's what we have in the ideal. Um, but this horse is far from ideal. Um, Confirmation wise is actually it's all over the places and you drop that perpendicular line down from the point of shoulder. It's got offset knees. It's rotated out from the fetlock. If you look at it straight on as well too in the right picture, <clears throat> you can see it a little bit easier maybe. Your offset knees. So it's not got great confirmation. And then that backed up with its lateral view as well too. Um again, in the ideal, we drop our line from the spine of the scapula all the way down front of the knee, and it should just land directly at at the heel. So this one is very much this this horse here, isn't it? Standing out in front. So there's a lot of hole, a lot of load right in that outside heel. Um as you can see here, it's going to be stressed. Um, the hoof capsule's not going to be able to function quite as good as it should be, or it's you know it's it's taking the brunt of the load in the back half of the hoof capsule, so it is. So as a result of that, it's popped a crack. So it has. Um, it's not. It's not bad at the moment, but you want to stop 
this crack, you know, every single time we're shooing a horse, we're trying to shoe the horse so that it's in a better position, the hoof capsule's in a better position for the next shoe, and that's what you're always trying to achieve. You know, you don't go with, fuck it, that'll do this time, I'll get it the next time. You can't do that because it takes a very, very short space of time. In a six-week shoeing cycle, if you've not fully covered the whole hoof capsule, it can completely fall apart, and it takes a really small space of time, six weeks, to destroy a hoof capsule. But then, you know, you could be another six months trying to get it back to a stronger position, so you can't use that attitude where you, oh, bugger it, that'll be enough, or I'll get that the next time. You've got to, you've got to every single time you shoot, put 110% into it. So, this horse, we can see, has the crack. We can see by, the, by its foot as well too, that this blue and yellow arrow that we've got on here, you know, there's a massive void in its in its frog, isn't it? It's not a very strong frog. It's got a wee skittery bit of frog down there, which can be weight burn, and it's got a little skittery bit of frog in here, but the center of it's completely useless. So we need to have that in mind. <clears throat> whenever we're shooting this foot that you know we're going to put a hard bar on it obviously and try and support that crack stabilize that hoof as much as we can and then hopefully repair it but there's not enough material in that frog really to do that you know we're trying to share load all around the hoof capsule as much as possible and um, not in the wall we keep our bars nice and strong as well too so we don't have as much movement um, and then put that frog plate on top of that on top of that frog so obviously it's going to get a hard bar we've all been there you know one hard bar is too small one hard bar is too big um you know you can't have it sat on its heels and support the point of origin and have the frog plate in the right place maybe because the, the hoof capsule itself is a it's a difficult shape to fit you know the bar shoes are absolutely lovely but the, you know, if you've got a twisted hoof capsule or a hoof capsule that's really narrow in between the heels, they are quite difficult to fit. Um, you could go down the route of welding in the inserts. Now, whenever I done this particular horse, um, that insert wasn't around, so it wasn't certainly, um, I think they come in two or three different sizes. But yes, that insert wasn't around. So anyway, we know what we want to achieve. We want to get a hard bar on its foot and... The way I done it was to use one of Jim Blurton's um, hard bars, but chop the frog plate out of it and weld it into a, a shoe that was already fitted up to the foot. Now, what's great about doing it that way around is that you can get that shoe wrapped around that foot 100%. So you can. Perfect for length everywhere. Perfect for cover. You know, sometimes if you're using an ordinary bar shoe or a, a machine-made bar shoe, you know, it's a little bit of give and take, isn't there? As such, and you can't 100% do what you want. You know, you can't have your nails. Sometimes your heel nails are bursting up because you can't get it tight or whatever. So you wrap your shoe around it. And this time, I've used an equilibrium shoe because I wanted to bring that, um, the break over back as much as possible because it stood out in front of itself. I want to reduce that lever, that lever arm. Um, I don't want to take the dorsal wall back because we've talked about that in the last one, you know, you make that hoof capsule weak, it already is weak, and it's loading too much in that back half of the foot, so that's exactly what we don't want to do. Um, so yeah, uh, equilibrium shoe on there, wrap it round, and then chop the frog plate out of a, of a Jim Blurton hard bar. Now, because that frog was really, really big and long, um, that frog plate's actually out of a, a number five hard bar so it's really long and it covers more of it you know you, you can obviously draw those frog plates out with your hammer but whenever you start to draw the frog plate it makes it very very thin and under the horse's body weight certainly whenever it's fully loaded um, it probably doesn't offer enough resistance it's probably moving a little piece so it's not rigid enough <clears throat> so if you use a, the big frog plate loads of material in it it'll hold its place an awful lot better. Um, and then, obviously, backing up, um, trying to load share as much of that hoof capsule as possible. I've done um, the mesh, in this case, as opposed to pads. So mesh, 
and hoof pack um, uh, and filling it up till it's really deep at the commissures, you know, to offer as much stability as I can and then phasing it out at the toe. So you can see there's a little bit of sole depth just so we don't get any sole bruising. You know, there's quite a lot of material put into that. Probably close on with a wee deep foot like that there, there's probably close on a, a full um, cartridge of hoof pack in there. Uh, you can fill up round the back with maybe the, the plastic from your your hoof pack or a little bit of uh, duct tape or something like that, just to stop your material from running out the back so that we have got all that hoof pack underneath that frog plate, you know, where the, where the, where the frog plate of the shoe can't contact the frog itself. That hoof pack, because it's such a strong structure, that's contacting the frog and we've got full load. Um, so that we shot that horse and that was the way we shot it until it was sold. Um, and obviously it was a good jumping horse and I think it sold for a considerable amount of money. So it was worth it to them in the end. It was a bit of an expense to put um, equilibrium shoes on and the mesh and the silicon, especially, you know, two tubes. And the frog plate into it and you have to charge accordingly for it i think it must take this close on a couple of hours unit horse but you just got to forget about that really and and concentrate on the fact that you know it's not a normal set of shoes you're going that extra little bit for it extra mile so you can charge a little bit more you know i think as farriers we don't really um portray ourselves as important enough or value ourselves enough you know you need to speak to your customer and tell them exactly what you're doing and you know you can charge this means you can you can charge more for it really um because at the end of the day you're you're keeping it going you know if, if this horse in this case you know it sold for a lot of money i don't know how much it was but it was plenty of dosh and it was never going to make that if it was going to be lame and a big crack in, in its foot and, and not doing any jumping so you know it made a it made a massive difference the next horse was <clears throat> Um, a big dressage horse. Um, again, going back to our ideal and what we know about conformation, we're dropping that perpendicular line. It's rotated outwards, isn't it? Base narrow and rotated outwards. Um, it's quite a it's quite a heavy big horse as well too. Um, but the problem foot was the. It was its off war, um, but only as a result of the tendon injury on its near four. It had about three tendon injuries in a row, um, one after the other. Um, so as a result of all these tendon, in tendon injuries, not bearing any weight on this leg, or very little weight, but taking all the brunt of the weight on the off four. After that period of time, um, there was going to be problems in the hoof capsule. So, a side view as well too. That um, spine of the scapula dropping that line actually doesn't doesn't look too bad. That one is pretty much dropping to where you want it, but you can see how how big the horse is, the big beast. So yes. The all that load and that off four has created this problem. Severely crushed heels, big bar crack. So that hoof capsule is just not function well at all. It's overstressed in this area here. You can see all this little bit of bruising in here. You can see that that's not a straight line. That's slightly straighter line, but it's still crooked. This is not a straight line. It curves right in there like that. Um, so we want to try and support that as much as possible. Now, very similar to the last horse, um, you know, we want to put bar shoes on it or a hard bar or something to, to create more of a, a load sharing over more of the structures. And then this way, this can get a little bit of relief. We can share a load on top of this frog because it's quite a big frog. It can take it anyway, so it can. You can see by the pictures, I know the hoof is not trimmed in this one, but the heels are 
a little bit far forward from where we really want them. We want to take them down a little bit till they're stronger. The whole lot's going to come down. But you can see that if we, we put a, a normal machine made bar shoe and wrap it around the perimeter of the hoof capsule and in here, it's going to be short of the length that we want, but it's also not going to cover the point of origin at the coronary band for the hoof capsule or the horny wall in here. So what I want to do is cover the whole lot of it. You can put a bigger one on, yes, but then sometimes whenever you put a bigger one and it, all of the shoe doesn't end up sitting on all of the heel, it just cuts the slide of it. The, the, it just sits in a, a slice of the heel or a portion of that heel, supports the, the point of origin at the coronary band and obviously you get your length. But because of that overloading in that heel, uh, on those wee tiny uh, slithers, then that heel doesn't actually stand any chance of recovering, and certainly neither does that bar. Um, you can see how flat that heel is there. I mean, it's as flat as a pancake. There's absolutely no heel depth whatsoever. Those horn tubules in here. Um, so, as I said, we talked about our bar shoes. One too big, covering the coronary band or point of origin, one too small, covering the hoof capsule, but, you know, not giving the length and support we want. Again, we didn't have these. Jim Blurton only brought these out last year, I think, um, which would have been ideal in that case um, for covering as much as the, the frog or putting the load in as much as the frog, and then you can put your... your um, hoof cushion material or your dental impression material underneath that really share load so what i done there's the area we're trying to cover in the red box this yellow line shows you know the end of the heels so you want to give a little bit of extra length don't we we're not right back to the widest part of the frog but we've got a load with the shoe that i've put on it right back onto the widest part of the frog and look at how much load there is on top of this frog here there's a colossal amount of load you can see by the burn mark right up in there look there's a burn mark where the shoe's coming right in here so it's sat the shoe sat on its heels it's sat on the bar because that's what the bars are there for they're supposed to take weight you know it's all about sharing weight over more structures of the hoof capsule you don't clean them bars out and then they're not they're not load bearing they're there for a for a reason leave them in there and leave them strong this one's not there obviously but this one is there and you can see where that shoe's just burnt down onto it and we want to give length you want to give support to this whole area here so we've when i made a european bar shoe for the job um obviously it's got a couple of tungsten pins in it at the back but it was only because the material was that broad I was a little bit worried that you know it would maybe slip and slide out on the the tarmac or the concrete outside its stable or the concrete inside its stable. I don't think it had rubber mats, <clears throat> so I just offered it a little bit more grip um, with the tungsten pins. So yes, fabricated up European bar shoes, um, just because I think they're they're an amazing shoe, aren't they? They just they just cover absolutely everything. Um, and I think I'd done a couple of shoes. We got quite a long time because it was such a broad section. The toe may be thinned down, but that didn't really matter anyway because I, your, your, the breakover was coming back anyhow. But because the material was that broad, um, you know, maybe get about three shoes out of each pair of, of European bar shoes I got, which made it a little bit more cost effective for me and for her, really. Um, you know, obviously you're spending an hour and a half making a couple of bar shoes and then another 30 minutes fitting them up to its feet. You know, there's only so much you can charge, really. So uh, at least if you get uh, another couple of sets of refits out of them, then you, know, you can kind of claw back some of your money. So a lot to cover. Right in there, covering all those heels there. You can see that bar and that foot. Your heel's in about here somewhere. Look at the amount of length that we've given. 
supporting the, the point of origin, the coronary band. And that's the way we shed that horse to say for about six shrooms until that foot got stronger. Um, and then from moving on from that, um, shoeing ways, I put a mass lock clip on it as well too, um, for extra effect. And then taking it forward, once we had done those those six shoons and that bar had come back strong again and you know she was feeling it was expensive enough for her getting the, the European bar shoes on it and it was time consuming for me as well too. Um but its foot got in, in in a strong position and we ended up putting or I ended up putting equilibrium shoes on. So bringing that break over back with the equilibrium shoe but keeping its toe strong, you know, talking about that hinge effect. That we're, talking, that we're talking about earlier on um, and shot it with the must add no shot pads along with the the hoof pack um, and those must add no shot pads are absolutely amazing compared to the old crappy plastic jobbies that we, we used to use <clears throat> we're back in our chaining the ones that squash down to about half the thickness of what you actually put them on with and then you come back at the end of six weeks and they're flapping about at the end of the foot smashing everything to bits and they were never strong enough you couldn't have put hoof pack underneath them or anything like that sort of material because they would have just bulged through but those no shock pads really keep their shape very very good and that was the way we shot it right up until it retired um I think event it would never really got over its its tendon injury on that side, so I got shoes off and retired at the end. But um, it managed to keep it going for you know five or six years after that. Um, and that's it. Presentation over. That's fluffy. Fine stamp of a horse. Um, so thank you for. Uh, listening to the presentation today and um, there will be a follow-on from from this presentation on my next uh, live video and um, probably be making or doing a demonstration on European how to make a European bar shoe I hope you've en enjoyed this it wasn't too long it hasn't taken too much out of your Friday nights you just can go out now and party um, and uh, thanks very much and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.